These are the contestants. The Japanese Zero. Light, fast, tricky, maneuverable. The American F2A. Heavy, slow, stodgy, tied to a string. This, one nation's product for aggressive intent. And this, another's product of neglect. The object, aerial supremacy. The result, disastrous. plane can be designed in weeks, built in months. It takes years to grow a pilot. One has a dollars and cents valuation, and the other is a more precious commodity. your host, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. Between wars, the military usually suffers budget trouble from the lack of adequate appropriations. The result is inevitable. We are unable to develop and maintain progress abreast of the nation, which are potential aggressors. The Marine Corps did not want to send its pilots out to fight a faster plane at Midway. But it had no choice. By scraping the bottom of the limited aviation bow, we managed to come up with 64 obsolete planes, 36 dive bombers, and 28 fighters. We knew they were no match for the Japanese Zeros, but what could we do? They were the best we had. They were all we had. And although the role our pilots and crews played was a minor one, we paid a high price for obsolescence. Steaming confidently across the threatless Pacific come six of the Pearl Harbor attack fleet. Soryu, Kiryu, Tone, Chikina, Tanakaze, Urakaze. To a confused public trying to learn a new language, the words and ships and places and men of World War II they sound like dialectic malaprops. Their destination, midway. Their purpose, to strike, damage, harass, destroy, and then continue to their homeland. Midway is not scheduled for invasion at this time. But the weather was rough and Wake Island rougher so they were diverted towards that tragic atoll. This gave Midway an additional six months to prepare for invasion. Their first sample of enemy intent was received on the night of December the 7th. On the shore, a lookout observes the light flashing southwest of Sand Island. At 9 p.m., enemy destroyers Akibona and Yushio begin their bombardment. the shells fall harmlessly until a lucky hit ignites the hangar roof. With this orientation point, the enemy pounds the torpedo and bomb site building, powerhouse, parachute loft, and radio transmitter building. An early hit on the communications center reduces coordinate effectiveness. But the officers and men of the 6th Marine Defense Battalion scored damaging but not fatal hits on the enemy, and both withdraw toward their homeland. 
and one of them is marked by destiny. For the Yushio of all the ships and carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor is the only one which will be afloat on that distant day when the war is ended. During the time at his disposal, Lieutenant Colonel Wallace, who commanded Midway's Marine Aviation Detachment, reported that operators were being inducted into the mysteries of radar. Personnel shelters were being built. Portable fueling expedients devised for emergency. A propeller shop was set up and a machine shop was under construction. Midway was preparing to repel invasion. Complacent behind the barrier of a difficult language, Tokyo speaks to its people and we record. Tokyo transmits to its outposts and we transcribe. Tokyo's fleet talks back and forth and we listen. Our ears are glued to the keyholes of the Pacific. How can we who cannot pronounce their simple everyday words hope to crack their intricate code? But it has been done. The garbled word is ungarbled. The scrambled, unscrambled. Their intent is clear. Invasion. Time in May. Location? They are too clever, and so we must deduce. Hawaii, says Washington. Midway, says Admiral Nimitz. And Admiral Nimitz was right. Available planes and pilots from the Army Air Force, Navy, and Marine were dispatched to Midway, as well as five more anti-aircraft batteries detached from the 3rd Defense Battalion at Pearl Harbor two rifle companies of the 2nd Marine Raider Battalion, and a platoon of five light tanks for Mobile Reserve. Plain shelters and two new 4,000-gallon gasoline tanks were built. A command post was completed, and camouflage and sandbagging of key installations were increased. Subsequent radio intercepts revised the date of attack and enable additional planes to be sent. By the 31st of May, the airfield in Eastern Island is choked with aircraft. Twenty-one Army Air Force, six torpedo-carrying Navy TBFs, 16 Navy PBYs for reconnaissance, and 64 Marine planes. 36 are dive bombers, commanded by Major Henderson, with Major Ben Norris second in command. And 28 fighters, led by Major Parks, with Captain Armistead as his second. Somewhere to the north, or east, or south, or west, the mightiest battleship ever built is ready, Yamato. 63,700 tons of invasion. In the periphery, Japan's two largest carriers, the Akagi, the Kaga. The Hiryu and Soryu are smaller, but no less deadly. Two battleships, three cruisers, and a score of destroyers accompany. On board are the invasion troops, to stamp the Emperor's mark on Midway. 2,500 Army, 1,500 from the Special Naval Landing Force, and 1,000 from the Ichiki Detachment, who will live through Midway and die on Guadalcanal. June 3rd, 0900. The pilot of a reconnaissance plane spots 11 vessels of the enemy. Supposition is fact. The target is Midway. Army 
B-17s find the fleet and drop their bombs. Near misses are bracketed, but the fleet closes toward Midway. June 4th, 05.25 a.m. The enemy has maintained his course. The message is relayed, received, and radar picks up many planes bearing 310. Distance, 89 miles. Another pilot spots a carrier bearing 320. Distance, 180 miles. Marine Aircraft Group 22's missions are assigned. Motors snarl their readiness. Twelve fighters, led by Major Parks, will intercept the planes. Thirteen fighters, led by Captain Armistead, will hold a position ten miles from Midway to intercept any breakthrough or attack from as yet undiscovered units. into two divisions. The 16 SBDs under Major Henderson are faster and will therefore attack the Japanese fleet. They must inflict prompt and early damage to the enemy carrier flight decks if their recurring attacks are to be stopped. The slower bombers, led by Major Norris, have the same assignment. The carriers, we are airborne, jubilant, determined, welcoming the conflict. We fly for the Marine Corps, our country, and our comrades. Retaliate for Pearl. Strike for Wake. Avenge Batan. We are 12 Marine fighter planes, 30 miles out at 14,000 feet. And there, beneath the cocksure enemy, his fighters below his bomber. He does not see us. Peel off, dive for speed, disrupt the hairline bees that head for Midway. We are 12, and he, 108. The odds are even. into his first wave of horizontal bombers and keep on scratching until 16 do not live to reach Midway. Goslings of a gluttonous goose. And now, rising through the disrupted waves of bombers comes the Zero paper mache with an engine, a tinderbox. We will send him to join his fallen nest mates. We will center him in our gun sight. Scratch, one of ours. And another. And another. And keep on scratching until nine of 12 are gone scratch until our squadron is no more. Scratch until only three of 12 live to report back. But our comrades in the slower planes, they have less chance than we. But scratch for them too. And in the second wave, a few zeros and 18 enemy bombers do not make their objective. of 
13 Marines. Once, we were 25. Now we are nine. 16 down and vulnerable. We have learned our antiquated planes are no match for the zero. We have been outclimbed, outdived, outmaneuvered. As a fighter force, Marine Fighter Squadron 221 ceases to exist, except on paper. The heavy loss to the fighter squadron was being felt farther afield. A normal mission would have continued to the enemy fleet to engage the Japanese zeros and give our dive bombers a clear run over their target. But the loss of our fighters did not stop the 16 Marine bombers. They arrived at their objective at 0800, altitude 8,500 feet, and started a long circle to launch a glide bombing approach from 4,000 feet. They were 4,000 feet short of their desired altitude when the zeros hit. Scratch, eight of ours. Eight of 16. The remaining planes score near misses of 20, 50, 80, and 150 meters. Machine gunning kills four enemy crewmen, but no direct hits are registered. The slow SB2Us arrive 15 minutes later and find the Zeros waiting. In the aerial fighting, they find themselves at the opposite end of the fleet axis from the carrier. To traverse the screening vessel's fire would be useless suicide. They pick a new target, the battleship Haruna. half crews, the pilot lives to fight again. As a single drop multiplies to form the deluge, so did the efforts of those who were lost become an important part of the aerial storm which was to overwhelm the Japanese fleet. The 25 marine fighters had so weakened the bomber strike against Midway that the Japanese air commander asked for a second attack wave. On the enemy carriers, a state of readiness. Fighters, warmed and ready, line the flight deck, ready to intercept, disrupt, destroy. Admiral Nagumo was in a state of indecision. 79 Army, Navy, and Marine planes had attacked his fleet. 53 had been destroyed. He had received no reports of American carriers in the vicinity, and so was persuaded that our air power had been destroyed. Decision is made. Clear the decks. Break the state of readiness. Take the fighters below and bring the torpedo bombers topside. One by one, they leave their iron nest. The decks are clear. It was a natural but fatal mistake. And when a scout plane radios American carrier, it is too late. Fighter planes cannot be brought up in time or in sufficient number to defend. And the decks must be kept clear to receive the planes returning from Midway. Now he is vulnerable. And vulnerable he remains as carrier dive bombers from the Hornet, Enterprise, and Yorktown begin their attack. Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, 
hear you for malaprops erased forever from our linguistic nightmare. And as the enemy birds return to find their nests are missing, they have but one eventual choice. But war must go on. On June 5, six marine fighters and six marine bombers are flyable. 12 of yesterday's 64. They are sent to attack two retreating heavy cruisers. The SBDs begin their dive at 10,000 feet. They bracket the Mogami with near misses. Five of six are lost. the fighters come in at 4,000 feet. Conjecture and controversy are born, which continue until this day. An American, a captain, a Marine, makes his approach toward the enemy. Begins his dive. Opposition fire his plane. He cannot hear the song of his flight or the thunder of his wings. His actions are history. He crashes into the Makuma. His reasons become the conjecture. But in the analysis of his example, there is no room for conjecture. It is service, inspired devotion above and beyond to his country and his corps. He too was a Marine.